Amen. So I'd like to take you to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And um, uh, what I'd like to do is I would just like to share with you uh, a passage of scripture that was just on my mind all day long. I will admit to you that it had a lot to do with just thinking about my brother Jesse and thinking about, um, you know, finishing our race and doing, doing what God's called us to do. Um, crossing that finish line, it was just on my mind and on my mind. And, and um, as I began to read it, I realized that there was something here that is, is necessary to say right now. So, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read from verse 5 through verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5 through verse 8. The Bible says this, But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. What we're reading tonight is a small segment of really two letters to the young Pastor Timothy, written by Paul the Apostle. And this segment, this passage here, uh, is actually written from prison. He was sitting in a Roman prison. And there was something that was very clear to him that he knew his time was up. He knew it. Now, no, you know, nowhere do we read that anybody came to him and said, on this day and that day, this is gonna happen. It's just he knew that his his time had come to an end. And so as I just looked at this and read this and meditated on it and dwelt on it. These were the things that came, came, came out and I just want to share them with you. Here he is in a, sitting in a Roman prison, probably having plenty of time to think. Probably the Spirit of God is, is letting him know he's, he's um, that his, his ministry is completed. Now, his ministry connects to a lot of other people, but his responsibility, what God had called him to do, had been completed. God's word tells us clearly, and actually Paul was one of, he was the one that wrote it by the Spirit of God, that, he, uh, that God is faithful to complete in us the work that he has begun. And we need to realize that God has begun an uh, incredible work in us. And it's not just salvation. God didn't just save us from hell and from the punishment of sin. How many know that that, uh, that would be enough, right? Thank God that if, if you're washed in the blood of Jesus, we're not, we're, you know, we're not going to hell. Amen. Does that sound weird to you? We say hell in church. No. Oh God, right? And so, what an incredible thing! And that would be that would be enough. That would be more than enough if all God did was send His Son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross, to pay for all of our sins, to forgive us of every single sin, and rescue us from eternal punishment. We call it hell. The Bible calls it hell. He rescues us. It's a free gift. We don't earn it. We don't uh, somehow figure out a way to deserve it. He rescued us from that. As a matter of fact, remember, hell is not made from that. Hell was made for Satan. 
and rebellious being, uh, uh, ain't fallen angels. But the Bible does say everyone who will follow him will follow him all the way to that end. If they follow him all the way to the end. And so it would be more than enough if the Lord just forgave us, saved us, and we are now rescued from the consequence of sin and the ugliness of separation from God. That would be more than enough. And thank God that's exactly what he did. He gave us eternal life. But he didn't just save us from something. He saved us to something. Amen. And so here's Paul sitting in a Roman prison. <clears throat> and he's got time to think. But you know, if you study uh, the Apostle Paul in the letters in the, in the New Testament, you realize that you can probably I have an idea of what he was thinking about. Because he was all about that. He was all about the work of God. He was all about having people get to know the love of Christ, the forgiveness of the Lord, the mercy of God, what God did for fallen people. That's what Paul lived for. And everything he did was to share God's word and to see if he can convince people that the Lord loves them and that, that they can put their faith and trust in the Lord and that they would never regret that. He lived for them. So as he's sitting there, he this letters to Timothy, and again, verse 5, he says, But you be watchful in all things. This verse starts out with the word but. The reason is because the verses before tell us that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of strange things are happening in this time. Uh, but I'll, I'll read it pretty quickly, but we're not going to elaborate. We're just going to see it real quick. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1 says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort, with all the long suffering and teaching. He's telling this young pastor, these are things you must do in shepherding the congregation, helping people to serve God and learn how to live for God. How many know that uh, we're learning every day. Anybody realize that? We're learning every day. So you'll make those mistakes. You know, God will show you. He'll teach you. You'll figure it out. You'll fix it. You'll work on it. And you keep going. And, and that's what's happening. But listen to what uh, verse 3 says. For the time will come when they will not endure sound teaching. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will keep up for themselves teachers. There's what the Bible is saying, what Paul's saying to Timothy is, Timothy, you're a young pastor. You're going to need to stand your ground and, and help the people that, that you shepherd. Teach them how to love God. Teach them how to obey the Lord. Teach them to serve God. But realize, you're going to have to do this. Folk. You're going to have to focus. And you're really going to have to give your all. You're really going to have to uh, realize that time is short. And then he gets into this part where, because the time's coming. Where people aren't going to want to hear what you have to say anymore. And he tells us the reason. He says, because there's going to come a day where people are going to stop wanting to hear truth. They're not going to want to hear the truth of God. What they're going to want to hear is whatever someone would say to them that would make them feel good. What, what does it mean by having itchy ears? Whatever their desire is. Uh, we can, there's a lot of examples of that in our world today. Uh, we all know who Oprah Winfrey is, right? Yeah. I mention her once in a while. But she's back, she comes on the news every so often, and it's always this thing about when she talks about your truth and my truth. We live in a time where people are literally thinking everybody has their own truth. Folks, that's impossible. There's no such thing. It's absolutely impossible for you to have your truth and me to have mine. There's only one truth. And that one truth shows when everything else is a lie. Just in, in referring to uh, you know my the type of work I like to do, a tape measure. Everybody knows what a tape measure is, right? Yes. Okay. Well, a tape measure is also called a standard. It tells you how long things are, how long this is, how long the aisle is. It's a standard. It's the truth, right? And so. I've used this before, but it's fine. I need a drink. <laughs> if I told you this is three feet long, you would say you're crazy. 
And I'd say, why am I crazy? You'd say, because that's not three feet long. Let's get a tape measure. What if I said to you, well, wait a minute. You have your truth, and I have my truth. And this is three feet long. You'd be saying you're tripping. That'd be, that's right. The reason is because truth is not a moving target. Truth is truth. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now Jesus is not being mean. He's not saying, oh, I'm not going to make any other ways. It, no, he said, I am the way, I am the door, I'm the good shepherd. But he makes it simple. He says to us, come freely, all who will believe, come. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to become something for it. You must believe. Now, where this comes into play is Paul's telling Timothy. There is coming a time where people will only hear what they want to hear. They'll, they'll go from place to place hearing what feels good to them. And the minute you tell them something that says opposite of what they want, oh, no, no, I can't hear that. I'm sorry. Sorry, no, no, no. That's, uh, that's, that's not the Lord. That's not the truth. I don't want to hear it. Anybody know anybody like that? Yes. Okay, now remember, don't elbow anybody. No. <laughs> yeah, I know somebody's right here next to me, Pastor. Don't do that. But we all know people like that. And maybe, no, maybe, I was like that. Matter of fact, that's, that's how I understood I needed to be saved. When God finally woke me up and made me realize, no, I wasn't right. I needed forgiveness. Amen? All right, so, here's how it plays out. <clears throat> uh, verse 3 again, For the time will come, Timothy, where they're not, they won't endure sound teaching, but according to their desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They'll handpick their teachers. They won't just receive whoever God picks, they will handpick them. And then it says in verse 4, they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And that's when verse 5 says, but you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And as he's sitting there in the Roman prison and he's thinking about what are the best things to say to this young pastor who's carrying on this ministry before I go, my time is up. And that's what he, he shares with them. But here's the thing. It's not something that he, he waited till the last day to say. I've, I've actually met people who, who think like that. I've even uh, read about it, seen it, where, where people, uh, they really make a thing of, what am I going to put on my tombstone? What do I want on my tombstone? And I'm not saying it's bad or good, or it's just an interesting thing. I think everybody's had that thought at least once, no? How many of you want something good on your tombstone? Right? You want I, I don't know. I want mine to say, I'm a man of God. Uh, you know, he likes coffee a lot. I don't know. I'm not sure what we're going to say. But, uh, but we, a lot of people think this kind of thing. You know, what do I want on my tombstone? And, and that's not a bad thing. Again, uh, you, you can put a really powerful thing there that would, would say something to everyone who would ever see it. And maybe it would reflect, you know, the words you really wanted to say. Well, we don't have to wait until we are already at home and there's a tombstone for us. We don't have to wait. As a matter of fact, Paul is actually encouraging this. Don't wait till the last minute. Do the work now. Fulfill your ministry now. Live this life now. Be that person now. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till one day. Here's what, what, I, what I started out sharing with you. the things that started jumping out of me. This man of God, Paul the Apostle, what he started to say, what I'm about to read, made me ask these questions. Can I say this on my last day? Will I be able to say this? Listen to what he says. He says, verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, 
and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And what else does he say? I have kept the faith. So he says, now this reward is stored up for me. When I heard, when I read that, when I was thinking about it, I'm telling you, it's been all day, all day, yesterday evening. Just it's just been in my mind. I started thinking, what's what, what is this that's, that's so important? What is this that's just eating at me? And I felt like the Lord like, put, put a light on it and showed it to me. He helped me see it. He helped me like connect with it. And this is what it was. Nobody, not one person is ever, on the last day, is ever going to be able to say this unless it were true. In other words, if you and I do not fight the good fight of faith, we will not be able to say on that last day, I fought the good fight of faith. I don't have any regret. I don't have any guilt. I fought the good fight of faith. See, Paul could say it because he did it. He preached it. He lived it. He discipled men and women to, to learn and live it as well. He, he was fruitful in this, and it was something that he didn't wait till the end to say. He'd been saying it all along. I'm going to show you in a minute that he'd been saying it all along. We're going to go backwards in the <laughs> So I, I realized that um, there are people in this world that are waiting, and I'm not even sure what we're waiting for. And here's the thing. If you're already a believer and you're still waiting to engage in a fight, not just any fight, by the way. I don't want to pull up one day and find out you were fighting down the street, okay? It's not, it's not what we're talking about. But the fight, the good fight, how many know that living for God, it is a fight sometimes. It is not easy. Sometimes you've got to stand your ground and you've got to fight. For example, fight for your mind. Fight for it. Read your word. Pray. Reject those ugly thoughts when they come. Fight for it. Amen. Right? Like that old saying, I mean, one of the brothers were sharing this other a brother or sister, I forgot who it was. Uh, you know, you can uh, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can prevent that bird from making a nest in your hair. <laughs> you really can. And the same thing goes with your thought life. When those ugly thoughts come in, you know, it, you might not be able to stop a thought from coming in because that's just kind of normal. But man, when it sits there and wants to make a nest and it wants to grow and have babies, that's when you and I got to say, uh oh, I can't live that way. I'm going to fight for this. I want my mind to be right. I want my mind renewed. I want to be thinking about the right things. You know? And so you got to fight sometimes. Sometimes you got to fight against those things that are a real strong temptation. Yes, amen. Real strong. How many know temptation can be really strong? And when it's there, sometimes we're like, I can't think of anything but this temptation. This is so hard to deal with. But I'll tell you what, when you realize what you're fighting for, you will. You'll fight. Paul was able to say, I fought the good fight. I ran the race. I like the way he always uses like those athletic terms. I ran the race. I cannot run half a block. I'm telling you right now, I try to run half a block. I'll drop over on, the, on somebody's grass and they'll think something's wrong with me. I can't run. It's, just, it's not one of those things I can do. But this is not what he's talking about. It's not about getting out there and jogging. It's about... The, your journey in Christ. It is also a race. And it's not a sprint. It's a long distance run. And he's saying, look, I've been running since, I, since the Lord saved me, and now I crossed the finish line. I finished it. It's not about how fast you run. Think about this. doesn't matter if you run really fast. I know a lot of people that run really fast and never finish the race. Come on. How good is that? 
Right? I'd rather have crawled it, man. <laughs> I mean, you guys know what a run looks like, right? But you ever see these speed walkers? <clears throat> Funny. They look like they shake their hips, you know what I mean? Anybody do that? Anybody? Like this. And there's this speed walk. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's crazy. But hey, I'd rather speed walk and finish than run like a champion for half of the distance. I don't want to run like a champion for half, half of the distance. So all right, let's, 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 let's finish this up tonight. I was thinking about, this whole thing was just me, I was just thinking about Brother Jess. I don't, I, we're going to say before that service all the different beautiful times that, that we've had with him and so forth, but there was just the things that stuck out to me about this man, the genuineness of it, how he absolutely loved to worship, how he absolutely loved to help if he could, and there were things he would do. There were things that he would do that would just blow my mind. The way his mind worked and the way his heart worked. And whenever we would sit down and talk, it wasn't a man of, of many words that some of you might know. But the few things that he would share here and there, he'd just tell me. I just love God. I just love God. I love the Lord. He... He saved me. He wouldn't, he wouldn't give me all the details. He would just tell me, I just love the Lord. And he saved me. Such a genuineness. So, after just knowing that he went home, I couldn't help but immediately think. He passed, he walked, he crossed over, and he got to hear these words already. He got to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, I've known him for a good amount of years now, and we've served God together for a good amount of years. I could testify what I know, that he was a good and faithful servant. Amen, amen. I could testify that. And so, uh, then I started thinking again, and it was, you know, thinking about thinking about, will I be able to say that when I get there, will I be able to say, I fought the good fight, I ran my race, I kept the faith, will I be able to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? And the answer is this, no one will be able to say this unless it's true. The only way you make it true is not that you wait all the way to the end, or you... You know, you sort of slow roll it and slow walk it in your decision making. And you're waiting and waiting and waiting. You don't know what you're waiting for, but you're waiting and waiting. Because here's the reality. Nobody knows when that last day is. Nobody knows. And so I want to close with this. I want to take you back to the very next, the book before it, which is 1 Timothy. And remember, this is Paul, his final days in the Roman prison. He's about, his life is about to be over. And he's telling Timothy, fulfill your ministry. You know, do it with all your heart. Recognize that time is short. Don't waste time. Don't wait. Press in. And, and, and then he's saying, I'm ready to go. No regrets. I'm ready. Well, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Go with me quickly. I'm going to read this for you. 1 Timothy chapter 6. When you're there, please say amen. amen. Verse 11. And I'm going to read up to verse 13. The Bible says this. But you, O man of God, remember, it's Paul discipling Timothy. This was quite a bit of time before what we just read, what we started out with. He says, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. Pursue it. You know that's an action word. That's not one of these words of, oh, if it happens, it happens. If I run across, if I get lucky, you know, if I, if, if I hit a stretcher and I win the big one, you know, no, it's, this, is a, this is an action word. Pursue. This is what he's saying. But you, O oh man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. 
Pursue godliness, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue patience, pursue gentleness. Stop right there for a minute. Notice he says pursue. He, he never really points out that we can completely attain. Because how many know we're never going to be perfect in righteousness on this earth? Somebody please say amen. Because it's true. We're never going to be perfect at it. And that's okay. The, the Lord's the perfect one. Amen. But hey, guess what? He didn't give us an excuse. Well, I'm not perfect, you know. Yeah. No, none of us are. We know. If you ever tell me I'm not perfect, that's I'm not perfect, I'm going to say I know. And, and it's because I do know. And if I tell you I'm not perfect, you're going to go, I know. Because it's true. It's true of all of us. But listen to the word. He didn't say pursue and then obtain and you're going to be perfect. He said pursue. When we stand before God, it's going to be, did we pursue that? Did we chase it down? Isn't that what pursuit is? Anybody ever been chased? <laughs> a few times? No? Where's my cup? No, I need another drink. You should see that because your face looked when he said that. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been chased. I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about these things. What we're going to talk about is that the Lord, uh, or excuse me, Paul, the Holy Spirit is telling Paul, and he's teaching Timothy, pursuit. You're, there's going to be some days when you're not pursuing that fast and your effort is, is not as good as it is other, other days and that's because you're human, that's because I'm human. That's a reality. Some days you're going to have awesome days and some days you're going to have, let's just be straight about it, you're going to have a terrible day. How many of you would admit that you've had some terrible days in your life? Come on. Here, let's go a little further. How many of you would say, as a believer, you're loved, you're forgiven, God, you know, you know you're saved, you know you're forgiven, you know you, you're serving God, but you still have a terrible day. Yeah, exactly. The baby is in the air. The baby is saying, I'm having one right now. I'm having a bad day. So this is a reality. This is why Paul said pursue. Right? So again, pursue these things. Verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Notice what we just read. He said, I fought the good fight of faith. I fought it. In other words, he said, I'm finished with my fight. But here, we look back, it's just a reflection on what Paul lived for, how he lived, how he thought, how he pursued Christ, obeyed the Lord. See, this is, wasn't this thing where he waited to the end to say, you know what? No regrets. I finished. He didn't wait because he wouldn't have been able to say that. It's because he lived it. <coughs> Did he live it perfectly? No. Even though he was a, a writer of two thirds of the New Testament, he wasn't a perfect man either. Jesus is the perfect one, and he was the perfect one in his life. But the Lord gave him these words. And so again, he said this. Fight, go ahead and, yeah. Yeah, want to finish the message. Yeah. She's, she's probably going to be a singer when she gets older. She says, oh, that's going to happen. And sing for the Lord. <laughs> you guys know me. I love babies, so we gave her a chance. <laughs> we gave her a chance to to turn that into amen, but she, she's not ready. She'll get it. Right, let's finish this up. So, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, <clears throat> and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. We're going to stop right there. What does he tell us? What was he preaching? What was he living out? What was he showing with his actions? He was showing that he, he was fighting the good fight all the time. He was running his race all the time. He was keeping the faith all the time. And so when he got to the end, you don't read that he was afraid. You don't read that he was uh, worried that it wasn't going to go well for him. He was absolutely confident that the crown of righteousness was waiting for 